so let us finish what we had started in the previous video which was about animal behavior so in this video i will finish mimicry and coloration and move on to taxonomy so mimicry as you all are aware of the term that it it means when a person or animal or plant resembles something which is very different from itself like another creature or an inanimate object it has various purposes for mimicking the other organism either for defense or to gain other advantages so when a perfectly harmless animal resembles um in its color and shape a well protected species then it is called mimicry it is uh, doing this because of its own benefit and excuse me so usually those species that mimic um that that are mimicked are poisonous or distasteful that means they are not very uh, good in taste so they mimic those so that the uh, the predator can uh, like leave them alone so that the predator will be alarmed and they will not attack on the prey so mimicry is very popular among animals and uh, it is also seen in commonly in butterflies birds uh, mammals etc so mimicry is of different types the first one is protective mimicry which is very common that when the organism is trying to protect itself so <clears throat> it is of two types either concealing mimicry here we can see that the leaf insect has concealed or hidden itself such that it can be confused as uh, as a leaf of a plant so this is known as a concealing mimicry next is a warning mimicry where this uh, snake poisonous coral snake has uh, is mimicked by the non poisonous scarlet king snake so if you, if you mimic a, a poisonous snake if a non poisonous snake mimics a poisonous snake then uh, the others the prey or the predators will be alarmed that this is a poisonous snake so let us just not attack it so therefore this is known as warning mimicry so this is also done because it wants to protect itself from any attacks so protective mimicry is of two types concealing mimicry or warning mimicry next is aggressive mimicry so when it is shown by carnivorous form so aggressive mimicry means it is a predator is mimicking a non threatening species or not non harmful object so that the prey is um, not alarmed or the prey is uh, like um, Uh, the prey does not pay any attention to it and it can then attack and kill it or feed on it so this is called aggressive mimicry where the mimic uh, where the organism may mimic something which is not harmful non threatening and therefore the prey gives access to the organism and it can easily attack it so some spiders show this kind of mimicry this is the sea dragon which is quite na natural it it looks like leaves and all so it will just hide and when a prey comes near it it will just go and attack so the prey will think this is something which is a non living object but it is actually its predator so auto mimicry auto mimicry means when there is the it mimics a certain um, part of its own body only here you can see that these pygmy owls they have false eyes on the back of their head so that means the predators are uh, will be fooled that which is its front side so if if someone wants to attack you from the back and uh, it sees that you have two eyes in the back also then they will be uh, taken aback and they will uh, not attack you uh, spontaneously so they will think that you are already watching them so some butterflies like this common tit they have a false head like see this this is a uh, perception of having a false head so this is a real head but in the back side also you see there are a, there is a like eye spot kind of thing and there is two antenna kind of thing which gives a false uh, assumption or illusion that this is also another head so which side it is looking it's very difficult to understand from there so this is known as auto mimicry when the organism mimics some parts of its own body only there are certain other types of mimicry such as the sexual mimicry when the male or female of a species mimics the other sex 
it is known as sexual mimicry so european yellow tailed moth the male mimic the females to gain protection from predators so the males are uh, mimicking the females so that the predators do not attack it so it is like is a mimic um, mimicking among the each other sex so that is sexual mimicry conscious mimicry is when an animal behaves as if they are dead when in danger this is known as conscious so we know that opossum when attacked by enemy it poses as they are dead so it's like you are acting like you are dead but it is not actually dead and therefore it protects itself uh egg mimicry when eggs of a bird are similar in size this is a very very common example we all know that egg of cuckoo resemble the egg of crow so sometimes the cuckoo lays eggs in the nest of a crow and then we find out that it is a cuckoo egg in in between crow eggs so this is egg mimicry so that it does not have to nurture the egg itself but someone else can nurture it and then the young ones can uh, hatch from there another type of mimicry known as the emslian mimicry or the martensian mimicry this is very unusual form of mimicry when uh, <clears throat> uh, it helps in lowering the predation rates because the predator eating a deadly species dies so it will be unable to transmit the information that the prey is harmful so the predation rate remains high so in this kind of mimicry a uh, prey uh mimics a, a deadly species uh, mimics a less harmful species so and the prey eats the less harmful species so it will transmit information to the other species that don't eat this prey it's harmful so what happens is that if an organism which is deadly resembles a less harmful organism and the predator does uh, does does know that it is less harmful so it will not eat it but if it is like uh, if the predator does not uh, stay alive when it is deadly if it eats and it, it's dead then it will not know that uh, the other information will not be passed on to the other predators also that this uh, uh, organism is deadly do not eat it they will they will not be able to pass on that information so therefore what happens is that a deadly species mimics a less harmful species so that whenever the less harmful species has already been eaten by the or predator species sometime or other and they know it is slightly harmful to them so they can pass on that information they will not die directly by eating it so they pass on an information that don't eat this prey it's uh, slightly harmful so for that reason the deadly species will resemble the less harmful species and so that it the predation rate gets lower so predators will not attack it because they already know it is some uh, some um, it is slightly harmful to them so they will not eat it but if it does not resemble any anything else if it remains as, uh, like itself then the predators do not know about it they will eat it and they will die so the information is not passed on to the other uh, other predators so for information to pass on to the other predators they are mimicking a less deadly uh, organism so now whenever they know that they, this is the less deadly organism i do not have to eat it because someone told me that it is uh, slightly harmful for me so they will not eat it in this way they are increasing its chances of survival so the predation rate gets lower so the predator stays alive learns that the prey is harmful and it stays alive the predation gets lower so this is a martesian mimicry two very popular types of mimicry are batesian mimicry and mullerian mimicry so this mimicry is a form of protective mimicry in which a uh, edible species resembles an inedible species so monarch butterfly and viceroy butterfly they mimic each other so viceroy uh, mimic monarch butterfly is inedible so viceroy butterfly mimics the monarch butterfly viceroy is itself edible but it will mimic the monarch butterfly and the predator will understand this is inedible so let's just not eat it so this is the mimicry that is forming mullerian mimicry is when two or more distasteful or poisonous organisms resemble each other so both this um, kaku bee and yellow jacket wasp they are poisonous but they resemble each other so the predator will be confused like uh, which is which and uh, therefore they will increase the chance of uh, 
survival because if they are confused then uh, if the predator knows at least one of them is deadly then it will not eat it so this is mullerian mimicry so what is the difference between betisin and mullerian mimicry where in betisin it is one harmful animal and one um, edible and mullerian is a two two both are dangerous animals and they are uh, like uh, they develop a protective mechanism and they are mimicking each other so these are exhibited by harmless animals these are exhibited by harmful animals so the mimic is benefited and here both the mimic and the predator is benefited they do not eat me because i am very deadly so this is the kind of mimicry they are doing model should be abundant than the mimic otherwise this will not uh, like uh, be useful here both predator and mimic may be equally abundant so this is the type of parasitic relationship because the mimic is actually benefiting on behalf of the model and this is a type of mutualistic relationship that you mimic me i will mimic you and we can both be safe together so this is a mutualistic relationship what is the difference between camouflage and mimicry so camouflage is basically the adaptation that animals are blending to their surroundings using a pattern using a color anything but mimicry is it it can imitate or it resembles some other non living or living objects then that we call it mimicry or it can be behavioral aspects also camouflage will obviously resemble their environment and mimicry is mostly they resemble another animal this is mainly by morphological characteristics this is also morphological physiological and behavioral mimicry main purpose is to avoid the predators and camouflage is to hiding and it occurs in animals this occurs in plants as well and um, there are few types of camouflage like concealing coloration disruptive coloration and disguise and the types of mimicry i have already discussed so cryptic coloration means that it is merging with its environment so that it cannot be seen so this is blend in and hide so it occurs in chameleons it's a very common example so this is a camouflage type of camouflage where we we want to hide from others warning coloration or aposematic coloration both are the same thing it means i will give bright colors i will show bright colors to as a warning that predators should avoid me i am very poisonous so this is known as warning or aposematic coloration disruptive colorations as you have seen the zebras they live in herds and when a lion attacks the zebras start running all together so the lion gets confused which zebra to pick up and it gets confused between the stripes where one zebra ends and the other zebra begins it cannot identify that so this is known as disruptive coloration where they are uh, where, where they are exhibiting a coloration in which you are not able to distinguish one from the other counter shading so you have seen sometimes that in mostly in case of aquatic animals the back side the upper side is uh, the darker and the lower side is lighter like in penguins also if you see so it helps them to hide from their predators for sharks and hawks the counter shading allows them to sneak up on their prey so when you look from below you will see that the lighter the lighter surface you will see and it is easy, not easy to understand whether something is floating or not but when you look from top the darker surface is there so here also you will not understand whether it is something is there or not so from this they from this counter shading they are uh, either sneaking up on their prey and attacking suddenly the prey is not able to understand or uh, i either they are protecting themselves from predators so anything can happen so this uh, <clears throat> and lighter on is underside normally in shadow reverse counter shading lighter on top and darker on underside is found in some animals to startle or warn of the predators so two types can be there counter shading either the back side is darker or the back side is lighter and the reverse is true so this is known as counter shading now a very important phenomena known as industrial melanism where uh, post industrialization what happened was due to high sulfur pollution and burning of coal the bark of the trees they um, became darker in color so this uh, particular moth population biston betularia which was white in color they suddenly uh, 
became to began to camouflage with the dark colored barks and became darker in color this species was known as biston carbonaria so in these two species what happened was that this uh, white colored moth was easily tracked by predators and therefore they were um, <clears throat> and therefore they were uh, easily attacked and eaten but the darker moths they survived because they could not be easily spotted by predators so this is a classic example of natural selection selecting the favorable species which have been uh, adapted to the atmosphere to the surroundings but the unfavorable one which could not adapt itself to the surroundings got eliminated so here it is the biston betularia population drastically reduced and the biston carbonaria population then increased so this is called industrial melanism next moving on to taxonomy and classification so taxonomy like uh, you already know is the study of uh, the different methods of classification so taxonomy includes identification nomenclature as well as classification so identification means identifying an organism nomenclature means naming that organism and classification means like putting them into different categories or groups and affinities means the studying their interrelationship among these groups so this word was proposed by ap the control and uh, this taxonomy can be divided into the following types like alpha beta omega gamma these are levels of taxonomy alpha taxonomy is uh, is concerned with finding describing and naming of organisms the first and basic step in taxonomy so it's based on external morphology and it does not consider any other aspects of uh, the organism so this is also known as classical taxonomy beta taxonomy is besides external morphology it is also includes internal characters so the taxonomy based on both internal as well as external characters is known as beta taxonomy so <clears throat> it includes identification of natural groups and biological classes so grouping on the basis of both internal as well as external characters is known as beta taxonomy gamma taxonomy includes the evolutionary uh, aspects of it also and therefore this is the next level of taxonomy so in this omega taxonomy has widest scope it is based on all the informations of data so from all various sources whatever information is available regarding one particular organism is taken into account for this type of taxonomy which is known as omega taxonomy and it builds up relationships among groups for better classification cytotaxonomy is when the grouping is done on the basis of the cellular characteristics like the this is called cy cyto means cell and therefore this uh, taxonomy is known as cyto taxonomy next is the chemo taxonomy for using the chemical characters of plants such as the chemical constitution of plants or the basic chemical care compounds like alkaloids carotenoids tannins etc which are produced by the plants on the basis of that if you uh, do the grouping then we call it chemo taxonomy next is karyotaxonomy which is based on the characters of nucleus and chromosomes so from that this taxonomy is known as karyo karyon means nucleus so what is the difference between taxonomy and systematics so taxonomy is a discipline of classifying organisms into taxa and systematics is the biology a field of biology that studies the diversification of species or the um, so taxonomy includes naming described classification and nomenclature is known as taxonomy taxonomy plus phylogeny that is the use of in evolutionary history and evolutionary relationships is known as systematics so the affinity is involved over here this term is given by linears this term is given by ap the control and taxonomy can be alpha beta omega but systematics uh, is uh, given by huxley so it refers to the study and classification of organisms for the determination of evolutionary relationship of organisms it is the field of study which deals with this and taxonomy is defined as the branch of science dealing with the study of classification so it includes classification naming cladistics phylogenetics it includes basic principles rules procedures and uh, the naming is there uh, and th this is all
so the history of classification so aristotle was the first person to classify organisms based on their physical similarity so he put two groups major groups plants and animals and he according to size he had divided plants into herbs shrubs and trees and in animals he had divided them according to the place they live in like land water air so he uh, he was the first one to document this kind of classification and then linear scheme and classification changed he created the hierarchy the taxonomic hierarchy and gave the binomial nomenclature the nomenclature in, with two names uh, the first one is genus and the second one is species so moving on to the types of classification we have artificial natural and phylogenetic system so artificial classification was given by theophrastus and linnaeus where uh, it involves uh, only one or two morphological traits and they classify the organisms on the basis of that but natural system of classification was given by this uh, john ray uh, pleo magnol and it it included several morphological characters for grouping of the organisms so this uh, this artificial system does not give any information about the phylogeny or evolutionary history but natural system includes uh, the relationships and the phylogeny of the organisms so related organisms are therefore placed in the same groups mostly but in artificial systems related organisms often get separated because you are only looking at morphological traits suppose you put bird uh, and bat in the same group then it will not happen uh, or bird and insect in the same group then it is very different from each other but natural system will take into account all the other or characters as well and therefore uh, the evolutionary history as well and therefore insects and birds will never be put in the same group you in this type of classification next and the most important one is the phylogenetic system of classification which is solely based on the evolutionary history and genetics of the organism so whatever the shared genes ancestral genes they have they according to that they have been classified and this is the most used most accepted form now because uh, we know that this uh, evil without evolutionary history the classification does not uh, is meaningless actually so therefore we have this artificial natural and phylogenetic systems of classification these three systems this is the phylogenetic tree of life where you can see from a common ancestor it has divided into bacteria archaea and eukaryota and it has gone into and it has branched again so this indicates at what time point the branching has happened at what time point this particular uh, family has evolved and this branching includes all the um, various groups of organisms and according to their evolutionary history so there are two types of taxonomy mainly classical and modern classical meaning the old ta taxonomy the alpha taxonomy and the omega taxonomy considering all the information available is known as modern taxonomy so this was pre darwinian and this was post darwinian and based on morphological characters it was done now they have considered morphological reproductive as well as phylogenetic characters so a large number of sample could be observed by this and with classical taxonomy only a few sample was observed so next is phenetics and cladistics phenetics uh, is also known as numerical taxonomy because it includes the physical attributes and the phenotypic similarities and then classification on the based of the morphological um, similarities but cladistics is ma mainly uh, with the help of evolutionary relationships so it is also phylogenetic and therefore their branching patterns is different from phenetics so in phenogram you can see that the branching is different of lizard crocodile bird and in cladogram the branching is different in lizard crocodile bird so lizards have evolved uh, much before so therefore we can see that they they have separated the branch and birds have evolved quickly since their divergence from crocodile so therefore the branching is short over here so this kind of phenetics is uh, based on morphological since lizard and crocodile look alike therefore they have given shorter branches over here and longer branches with bird because bird is very dissimilar but in cladistics they consider the evolutionary relationship so since lizards have evolved way before birds so the uh, short uh, short branch is bird and the longer branch is lizard so this is the basic difference between phenetics and cladistics 
dendrogram cladogram and phylogram like i was saying dendrogram means any uh, type of diagrammatic representation of a phylogenetic tree can be called as a dendrogram now cladogram is usually they do not represent evolutionary time they just uh, so they just represent a hypothesis about actual evolutionary history so tree 1 and tree 2 they are cladograms and tree 1 is equal to tree 2 because of this but Phylogram is a tree in which lens they represent other actual uh, time taken for the particular taxa to evolve. So this uh, length represents evolutionary his time in evolutionary history. So tree, tree, tree three and tree four are different because the length of the branches do not uh, indicate the timing of evolution. So here the length of the branches have no um, sorry I was wrong the, here the length of the branches have no significance regarding the time in evolution history and here the length of the branches have a significance in the evolutionary history so longer branches and shorter branches have a meaning here so they are called phylogram and cladograms they do not have such uh, significant uh, meaning but when, whichever is uh, evolu uh, whichever has evolved uh, faster that will be given a longer branch and whichever has evolved later that will be given a shorter branch next is binomial nomenclature which was obviously given by linears and it has two words or two epithets known as gener genus and species so we all know these principles of binomial nomenclature that the genus name come first species next and it should be in latin it should be italized while writing or underlined and the species name should start with a small letter genus name should start with a capital letter so these are already known so uh, the linear uh, linear hierarchy system it includes of these things like kingdom phyla class order family genus species so if we consider homo sapiens it will start with kingdom animalia then it will move on with chordate phylum chordata then class mammalia order primates family hominids genus homo and species uh, homo sapiens so from here to here, this is the uh, like hierarchy of Homo sapiens. Primates with collarbones, sensitive fingers, flat faces, upright posture, large brains, and then finally genus Homo with uh, forehead and thin skull bones. So this is linear hierarchy. So coming to here. This is phonetics, cladistics yeah so any group or any rank in the taxonomy is known as a taxa like phylum is a taxa uh, kingdom is a taxa like that so with this so the biggest taxonomic rank is kingdom so biggest taxa is kingdom and the lowest taxa is species so because kingdom goes on to divide into phylum then class then order then family then genus then species so this is the linear hierarchy it had seven taxa but it becomes necessary to distinguish between two successive taxonomic ranks. Therefore, the extended linear hierarchy included some subphylum, suborder, subclass, subfamily, subgenus. Because it was necessary to include one taxa in between two consecutive taxa so that the classification is more accurate. Therefore, these three, uh, then sub subgenus, subspecies, these again came into existence. Species is the lowest taxonomic rank and it represents organisms that are very closely related to the each other and a species can be a group of closely related which are structurally and functionally similar organisms. They can breed among themselves but once uh, organisms of one species cannot breed with organisms of another species that means they are reproductively isolated from other species. So members of a species could be spread over a wide biogeographical area uh, which um, is uh which has environmental variations also. So the present day human beings, irrespective of their nationality, color, caste, region, etc., they all belong to one single species known as Homo sapiens. So with this, uh, the uh, there is uh, this this week uh, videos end and if you have any problems then we can discuss in the live class following thank you